Hi, and welcome to this podcast, which is going to be on Streptococci. So in this podcast, we're going to go into quite a bit more detail with a specific group of organisms. Um, and I hope uh, that I'll be able to answer this question about, you might be thinking, which is, well, okay, why should I care about these particular things? So Streptococci um, are bugs that you will have probably come across when thinking about skin conditions or respiratory tract infections or infections uh, of pregnancy and um, the reason I'm part of the reason I'm doing this is to give you a little bit more detail about the organisms themselves but also to address their classification system because sometimes you will refer to we will hear streptococci referred to group A or sometimes they'll be called by their Latin name or sometimes they'll be referred to as particular groups and what I'm hoping is that um, this podcast will give you a little bit more information about them. Okay, so on the right hand side we can see a microscope image of streptococci and obviously in order to see them we have to have gram stained them and these are purple bugs which means that they have been, we would, we would classify these as gram positive um, as opposed to pink stained bugs which would be gram negative. And these streptococci grow as cocci, so they're round cells but you can see that they grow, that they grow end on end so they seem to be formed as a chain and they are in some cases paired up so you can see pairs up here and pairs down here and in some cases the pairs are so closely tightly packed that they actually look like a short rod. I'd just like you to consider how growing in a chain differentiates them from staphylococci which are also cocci cells. So what we're going to consider to start with is we're just going to consider the name and this is kind of an obvious place to start, but it's quite important because sometimes you'll see in the literature and papers and so on, people refer to streptococci and they'll then also refer to streptococcus. And one is in italics and one isn't. So what's the difference? So firstly, let's consider an example. This is an organism called streptococcus mutans. So first of all, the two words here. One is referred to as the genus when we're talking about classification of organisms and the other is referred to as the species. Here's another example, Streptococcus pneumoniae, this is the pneumococcus. So this, the pneumoniae part tells us that it's a different species of the genus Streptococcus. Now together, these organisms are examples of Streptococci. So Streptococci are just more than one Streptococcus bugs, basically. It's not in italics because this isn't a, an official way of, of this isn't an official uh, classification name. Now, down the microscope, um, streptococci really all look the same. Um, this is an example, so you can see diplococci cells. In this case, they they're not as obviously growing in a chain, but it's very difficult to look down the microscope and tell anything out about an organism. Uh, and, and they're quite a big problem because uh, hundreds of species exist in different strains and so how can we differentiate them between each other? And so we have to use biochemical assays in order to do this. So that means first of all we have to take a swab from a patient and we have to grow it in a lab, we have to culture it in a lab. Um, if you'd like a little bit more information about how we do that then I've got another podcast on culturing as well. So when we're growing bacteria in the lab, it's quite common that we will use um, agar that's been supplemented with blood. Uh, and specifically, we buy in um, red blood cells that have come from another mammalian source, usually sheep or horse blood is used. Um, using human blood in laboratory tests is um, extremely difficult. But um, to give you a quick refresher, so agar, which is the kind of jelly substance you can see here, is... Um, rich in protein, sugar, sort of high in water, and it allows the bacteria to grow, and it allows um, streptococci to grow quite easily on the surface. There are lots of other pathogens that will grow on blood as well. And um, what happened was that when when people started to to do this, they noticed that the bacteria that grew on the surface started to uh, react with the blood. And specifically, as you can see here, um, these bacteria actually started to change the colour of the blood. So you can see where the lab scientist has basically taken a um, swab and they've moved it over the surface of the agar. The, the term here is we say it was streaked over the surface of the agar. And every time it's been, the bacteria have been thinned out more and more and more until eventually we've got individual colonies here of bacteria 
And because, remember, bacteria grow by binary fission, we know that these colonies have come from individual cells. Now here we have a region of agar which has no bacteria in, and it's kept its vivid red colour. But where we have high numbers of bacterial cells, we're starting to see um, some fading of the blood appearing. And this is where bacteria are performing a process called hemolysis. So that is that these, this particular strain is actually lysing the red blood cells that it's growing on top of. So hemolysis is an important term to be aware of because it's one of the many biochemical tests that microbiologists can use to begin to get more information about the type of uh, streptococcus or streptococci that you're working with. Okay. Now there are three types and you'll often hear these referred to when talking about this, these particular um, bacteria. Now the first is called alpha hemolysis. So here on the right hand side we have our uh, blood agar plate. So we take our swab, we streak it onto the surface, colonies grow. Um, but the colony itself may turn a kind of greeny colour um, and um, this is basically due to the fact that the bacteria are oxidising the iron atom that's found within haemoglobin. So they actually take on some of that coloration from the, um, from the blood underneath. Sometimes with alpha hemolysis you'll actually see a very tiny amount of hemolysis, actual kind of destruction of red blood cells growing underneath the, the, the uh, colony of bacteria as well, though not always. So the second type of hemolysis is called beta hemolysis. So exactly the same thing as before, we take our bacteria, we strike them onto the surface of the blood agar, colonies grow, only now surrounding the colony we actually see a zone of clearance. So this is where cells have begun to secrete something, probably an enzyme, into the surrounding media that's actually begun to break these red blood cells down. And so you get this zone of clearance as, as the cells disappear. So what this means is that if you have a strain that someone refers to as beta hemolytic, it should tell you that this cell, these cells have the ability to secrete toxins that can break down mammalian cells. And so that should set off a little alarm bell that this is probably a particularly dangerous pathogen that you might be working with. And lastly we have gamma hemolysis. So again, exactly the same thing, colonies grow, only this time no hemolysis is, is observed. Now it's important just to clarify here that just because you have an organism that's gamma hemolytic doesn't necessarily mean that it's non-pathogenic. There are examples of pathogens, specifically enterococcus, which are important pathogens to be aware of and that they are gamma hemolytic strains. Enterococcus is an interesting example because it used to be called streptococcus, it's very closely related, it was renamed in the 1980s. I just want you to please be aware of this third type of hemolysis. Technically, I suppose, it shouldn't really be called hemolysis. And here we have a picture that shows them quite nicely. So alpha, beta, gamma. Alpha, again, you can see the colonies turned a slight greeny colour uh, with a little bit of fading here, which could be uh, a lysis of red blood cells. Beta hemolytic strain, you can see this massive zone of clearance around the organisms. And then gamma hemolytic, you can see the cells have got this kind of creamy colour to it and there's no breakdown of red blood cells. So I wanted to go through just a little bit of an example now. Um, and again, if you don't know this organism or you've not heard of it, it is worth spending a little bit of time just reading up on Streptococcus pyogenes. Uh, this is a really important pathogen with respect to skin conditions and upper respiratory tract infections, so it is worth um, just being aware of. Um, this is a picture of the organism being grown on blood agar, and hopefully you'll be able to look at this and tell me pretty much straight away what type of hemolysis uh, this organism is exhibiting. Hopefully you said beta hemolytic, or beta hemolysis that's going on, as shown by the zone of clearance around the colony. And um, it is worth just being aware of strep pyogenes and why you should care about it, which is that it causes a range of infections from both invasive and also sy systemic fevers. Um, and it's also an important cause of rheumatic heart fever and also um, uh, heart disease. Um, and in terms of the numbers of cases as well, we see it not just in the West, but also in developing countries. So it is important with, uh, in the context of global health. Now, 
Um, you're, when you're doing your reading, and I recommend you do it, you'll probably see that strep pyogenes is referred to as a beta hemolytic strain. That was just that was just shown on the on the previous slide. But the strep pyogenes is also referred to as Group A streptococci or GAS or gas. And I just wanted to spend a little bit of time clarifying what we actually mean by Group A, because we, if we have Group A, then it kind of suggests that we have a Group B, Group C, Group D, and so on. So what do we mean by this? So as well as looking for the ability of streptococci to grow on blood, um, there is another way, another way that we can group streptococci, and that is to look at antigens that are present in the cell wall of the cells. Um, and this is sometimes referred to as Lancefield grouping, or specifically we refer to these as Lancefield antigens. And this is named after the scientist Rebecca Lancefield, who discovered this, who was a very eminent microbiologist, um, who did research into the cell wall of gram-positive bacteria. And um, what she looked at were sugars that were scattered throughout this, uh, this, this cell wall. Um, and what she found was that there were specific sugar polymers that seemed to be found within some uh, strains of streptococci and not in others. And they kind of acted a little bit like a fingerprint for each strain or species of streptococcus. So just, um, just to refresh your memory, you'll note this is a gram-positive cell wall, single lipid bilayer, thick peptidoglycan layer, and you'll note that as unlike with the gram-negative cell, there isn't a second lipid bilayer on the outside of the cell. So um, what, she, what Rebecca Lunsford began to do, what people now do, in the, if you read the literature and look at the research, is that streptococci can sometimes be grouped into different um, groups, which at the moment go from A to group U, um, and there may well be other groups that are discovered in the future as well. But it is worth saying that, confusingly and annoyingly, um, not all Streptococcus strains can actually, or species can actually be assigned to a group. So there are some examples which we'll talk about in a moment, which don't have any of these sugars or these Lancefield antigens present in their cell wall. That's not to mean that they don't have an intact cell wall. All this stuff is there. It's just that these particular markers that we look for seem to be absent in these strains. So we've already talked about group A streptococci. There's an example here of group B streptococci. Um, and um, like group A, group B only has one streptococcus member, and that is this organism called Streptococcus algolactini. Um, and um, you can find more and read more about group B strep um, at this uh, website. So it is worth saying that um, when we're thinking about this, group A is generally only found on the skin and sometimes in the upper respiratory tract. Group B strep is usually only found in the GI tract. Um, and group B strep, if you remember your um, infections in pregnancy, group B strep is a really important uh, infection to be aware of within pregnant women. Uh, and if, uh, well, I'd like you just to take a moment just to refresh your memory by what we mean by TORCH. What, what is the TORCH acronym? What do the letters stand for when referring to uh, important infections in pregnancy? Now, as I said before, not all strains can be assigned to a group, and then that just means that they lack antigens in their cell wall that allows them to be typed. So how do we group these? So one of the groups that you'll have you'll have heard of hopefully is this thing called Viridans group strep um, and um, these are the professional goo makers as I refer to them um, so these are basically cells which have the intact cell wall they just lack the antigens that allow them to be grouped into A to U. Viridans group strep are those that are considered to be alpha hemolytic um, and you'll have encountered these in year one um, and I'd like you just to take a moment to refresh your memory and think, where did you come across these? So you would have come across these in, first of all, when considering endocarditis, and the example here was Streptococcus mitis. You would also have come across this with Streptococcus mutans as well, and these cause dental caries. These are all examples of Viridans group strep. So what are the main summary points from this thing? So firstly, streptococci just means several species of the genus streptococcus. Secondly, 
All streptococci can be grouped according to their reaction on blood, of which there are three types, alpha, beta, and gamma. Thirdly, some streptococci can be grouped according to their cell wall antigens. Groups A to U and the antigens we're looking for are sugars, which are called lance-field antigens. But importantly, not all can be grouped, and some get grouped according to some special abilities that they have, such as making extracellular polysaccharides like we see with the viridans group strep. So with regarding streptococcus, there are a couple of just important things to say finally. Just a reminder that we have, with streptococcus, species which are alpha hemolytic, species which are beta hemolytic, and species which are gamma hemolytic. Examples which are alpha hemolytic include, include those which are belong to the viridans group, and also streptococcus pneumoniae, which is alpha hemolytic as well. Beta hemolytic strains include group A strep, which is strep pyogenes, and group B strep, which is strep algalactidae. And also, lastly, we have gamma hemolytic strep, and this includes strep enterococcus, specifically enterococcus fecalis. In sometimes in your textbooks, you'll see enterococcus fecalis is written as streptococcus fecalis. This is just the old name for it. Enterococcus is basically gamma hemolytic strep. Okay, so it's a very very closely related organism. You just need to be aware of the fact that sometimes the name has been has been changed. This happened in the early 1980s, I think. Lastly, what do you need to take away from all this? What am I looking for? So basically, there's a couple of things to think about. Firstly, just be aware of the tests in really basic terms. So what do we mean by hemolysis? The fact that it's a, just a test that's used to differentiate and group some bacteria. And then you can also group according to the cell wall antigens. This will really help you when you come to do your um, extra reading around. And then as you move into the hospital clinic, it's just worth thinking about what kind of samples can be sent away to the to the to the lab for diagnosis. So, for example, um, culturing an organism and looking for its uh, hemolytic activity is a really simple test to be able to do. But increasingly, we're using more sophisticated but somewhat more expensive tests like Maldi Toff. So, um, Jim Gregg, if he hasn't already done so, would have hopefully described what Maldi Toff is and some of the other tests that we can send to the to the laboratory. If you have any questions, then I suggest that you go and review that lecture or you're very welcome to contact or come and find me and I'll see if I can answer any of your questions. Thanks.